What does it take to make a seed grow into a thriving plant? Basically, it takes soil, water, and sunshine to grow. Now, those who make their living in farming will tell you it takes a whole lot more than that, but those are the basics. Now, over the past few weeks, we have been considering the subject planting seeds, harvesting souls, taking the agricultural illusions in Scripture and applying them to the task of evangelism, bringing others to Christ. So far, we've considered tilling the soil, planting the seeds. This morning, I'd like to continue that emphasis on watering the plants. That passage that Bonnie read earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and God made it grow. See, Paul and Apollos were different ministers there at the church at Corinth. Paul was the church planter. He got it started. He established that church there in Corinth. He got it grounded in the faith. He established some leadership, and then he moved on to another ministry. He was followed by another man named Apollos. Now, Apollos was a different kind of minister. He was, had a different, um, different kind of ministry, different style. And so some of those folks were taking sides. They were saying, well, I like Paul And others said, well, I like Apollos. And Paul is saying, you're missing the point. (laughs) It's not Paul or Apollos that matters. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, God is the one who makes it grow. What that shows us is that we all have different roles. We have different parts that we play, even in the sharing of the gospel with others. Some of us will initially plant the seed of truth. And we may not see it come to fruition. Others may come along later and water that, encourage it to grow. You may not be the first person to talk to somebody about Jesus. Maybe somebody already broke that ice. You come along later and you're able to share some more. You're able to bring it along. And maybe you will see that person come to Christ, or maybe that will be left for somebody else down the road. But we're all part of the process. We're all part of the team. And what I'd like to look at this morning are five principles in watering the plants of evangelism. Five things we need to be if we want to effectively share Christ with others. First of all, we need to be prepared. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.15, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared. That's the motto of the Boy Scouts of America, isn't it? But long before they were ever organized, the Bible were telling Christians, be prepared, be ready. Well, be prepared for what? For people to ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have. In short, why are you a Christian? And if we ever needed to be prepared for that question, it's today. Now, more so than ever, Christianity is being questioned. Christianity is being directly challenged. You may not just be asked, why are you a Christian? You may be asked, why in the world are you a Christian? Why do you believe that stuff? Are you out of your mind? (laughs) That's the approach many have today. And we need to have an answer. We need to be able to give good, solid reasons for why we believe what we believe. 
Maybe somebody tomorrow will ask you, hey, how was your day yesterday? Well, pretty good. I went to church in the morning and then had a nice afternoon. He said, go to church? What do you go to church for? What do you find there? I mean, nobody goes to church anymore. What do you do that for? What would you say? Would you have a reason? Would you be able to explain what it is that you believe? Why you call yourself a Christian? Peter says, always be prepared. We need to have the answer ready before we're asked. Don't wait until you find yourself in that situation and say, Oh, what do I say now? Uh, Here, let me give you the preacher's number. (laughs) Now that's fine, you can do that, but it won't be nearly as effective as if you can give an answer for your faith. Kenneth Wiest calls defending the faith every saint's obligation. That's our job. Not just the pastor, not just the elders or the leaders, everybody. We should all be able to give the simple basics of what we believe and why we believe it. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to know every passage and every address and all that stuff. But do you know why you're a Christian? Do you know why you believe what you believe? They call that field apologetics. Now, a lot of Christians are uncomfortable with that word because it sounds an awful like apology. And and apologetics is not apologizing for your faith at all. No, it is the very task of what Peter says here, giving an answer for the hope that we have. Next week, we're going to look at some very specific challenges to our faith. Questions that some people will ask us, and sometimes it's just to trip us up. They want to have an excuse to not accept what we have to say, and so they'll come up with these difficult questions. We're going to look at some of those. I'm going to give you some responses that you can have to those specific things. But this is more general. Why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you go to church? Why do you call yourself a Christian? And we need to be ready. Maybe you'll go your whole life and nobody will ask you those questions. But more than likely, I think you will. If people know that you're affiliated with a church, if they know that you call yourself a Christian, they're going to ask. And we need to be ready. And this is really just a simple step of obedience. (laughs) We are called to always be prepared. And notice the end of the verse. Peter not only tells us to be prepared, but he also tells us how to answer those questions. He says, do this with gentleness and respect. (laughs) I've known of some Christians that like to bash people over the head with the truth. That doesn't work. It's not effective. You may be totally accurate in what you're saying (laughs) but if you try to jam it down somebody's throat it is not going to be effective do it with gentleness do it with respect for the other person even if you don't respect what they believe and if you don't respect their lifestyle don't treat them with disrespect They are still a person. They are still a human being created in the image of God for whom Christ died. That makes them valuable. Treat them with respect. Treat them with gentleness. Now, you're not always going to be treated that way. And more and more it's become common. It's become even acceptable to treat Christians and Christianity with disrespect. Don't stoop to that level. Don't fight fire with fire. You will lose your opportunity. Always maintain the high ground. Treat them with gentleness and respect. Think about a a spray nozzle on a hose. Those of you that garden, maybe you're going for flowers or maybe you're wanting to have a a small vegetable garden in your yard. And and you have a hose, you're going to water the plants. That oftentimes they have an adjustable setting, right? And it's really tempting sometimes to put that on jet stream. You know, the most powerful thing, just you know, like power washing those flowers. They're probably not going to survive, are they? 
if you're going to water plants, especially young plants that are just starting to come up, you put that on a gentle spray. And you allow the water to, to sink in and nourish those plants. We need to take that approach with people, too. Don't always take the jet stream approach to evangelism. Because uh, very few people are ever power washed into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Colossians 4 verses 5 and 6 puts it this way. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Seasoned with salt. So that you may be able to answer everybody. Once again, the end result is the same as what Peter said. To give an answer. But how do we do it? With our conversation, the words that we speak, the attitude we project should be full of grace. Oh yes, we're handling the truth. But do it with grace. Seasoned with salt. Make it appealing. Maybe you've sat down to a meal and you've got some corn or some green beans or maybe some potatoes and you take a bite and you're like huh doesn't taste like nothing so you grab the salt shaker and put a little salt on there right makes it more appealing more appetizing now i'm not saying water down the truth we're not talking about that we're not compromising the truth but there are ways in which we can whet their appetite and make it a little more appealing. We're going to talk about how to do that in a moment. Secondly, we must be practical. One of the biggest objections people outside the church have to Christianity is, oh, it's just pie in the sky. It's irrelevant. It doesn't say, doesn't speak anything to my life. How could a book that was written 2,000 years ago have anything to say about today? We've got to be practical. We have to show that the Word of God speaks to today. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, just start with that basic element of truth. Ask them what 2 plus 2 is. Hopefully, they'll say 4. You say, what do you think 2 plus 2 was 2,000 years ago? The answer was still 4, because it's a truth. Truth doesn't change. What was true then is still true today, and it'll be true 10,000 years from now. Now, that's a, that's a radical concept in our era because our culture is trying to teach people and they're starting in our schools with our young people that there's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as absolutes. But we know better. Common sense tells you there's such a thing as truth that stays true. That's where we begin. But we need to show that Christianity is relevant, that it is Practical that it speaks to today. Somebody once asked the famous theologian and preacher Karl Barth, how do you prepare your sermons? And his answer was classic. He said, I take the Bible in one hand and I take a daily newspaper in the other. I don't think that's a bad analogy for Christians today. I think we need to both be knowledgeable of the truth, but we also need to know what's going on in the world we need to know what people are talking about. We need to know what they're interested in. We need to at least have a working knowledge that we can carry on an intelligent conversation about what's going on in our world. That's how we get to know people, find out what is important to them. And he said, oh, wait a minute. What does the Bible have to say about things that are going on today? You know, what's the Bible have to say about balanced budgets in government or you know taxes going up and down or the economy or what was the bible have to say about um abortion uh, what, what's the bible have to say about uh, euthanasia and we're not talking about children in china at that point uh what did the bible have to say about these things that are being talked about today you can't go to a verse that speaks to abortion because that word wasn't used back then you can't go to a chapter and verse that talks about the economy or last night's game or 
the latest movie that's come out. But what you can find in the scripture are principles, and those principles speak to every area of life. And so we need to know what's going on, and we need to know what people are talking about and what's in, what they're interested in. Let me give you a few examples from the life of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, the, the Jews and the Pharisees in particular came to Jesus and said, Give us a sign. You say that you're the Messiah. Give us a sign. Now, I don't know about you. By this point, because this is well into Jesus' ministry, I just said, You mean another one? How many do you need? I mean, he had already done all of these miracles, but here they are. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. Instead, he replies with something they were very familiar with. He says, you know, you look up at the sky, and if the sky is red in the evening, you'll say, tomorrow's going to be a nice day weather-wise. But if the sky is red in the morning, you're going to say, it'll be stormy today. Does that sound vaguely familiar to you? I know when I was growing up, and I grew up in another state, so it may have been worded a little differently. But there was a saying that said, red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky at morning, sailor take warning. Why in Ohio they're talking about sailors, I have no idea. But that was just the way that I learned it. Did you know that was in the New Testament? Did you know they were saying that 2,000 years ago? And you know what? It's usually true. (laughs) That usually does work out that way. He used something that they were already familiar with and then introduced spiritual truth. You know how to read the skies, but you can't read the signs of the times. In another case, later on in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, The same people try to get him into a political trap. They try to get him into a a place, paint him into a corner so that no matter what he says, he's wrong. You ever been there? (laughs) You ever been in a conversation, somebody starts to bring up politics, and you know that no matter what you say, there's going to be a fight. And Jesus, rather than taking sides, rose above it. They tried to get him on taxes, and he says, you know what? You give Caesar his due, you give God his. And there was nothing they could say. (laughs) Neither side could either say, well, he's on our side and not yours, or, well, he's against us. It was brilliant. Spoke right to the issue that they were talking about. In Luke 13, Jesus brings up examples that were happening right in their own day. It was like he was reading out a newspaper. Yeah, you hear about that uh, tower in Siloam that fell and killed 13 people, or or 18, I think it was. Uh, About the Samaritans that Pilate had to go in and break up this riot, and he did so violently, and there was a lot of bloodshed. They knew what he was talking about. Those were things people were interested in at the time, and he was able to start there and introduce them to truth. Now, how can we do that in our witnessing? That's where the little insert in your bulletin comes in. You got a little piece of paper, should have been in your bulletin. It's called a witnessing wheel. You'll notice it has two circles, an outer circle and an inner circle. The outer circle represents those that are unsaved, those who do not know Jesus Christ. The inner circle is Jesus. Our goal is to get them from out here to in there, and how do we do that? Well, you'll notice some straight lines. They're like spokes in a wheel. I'd like you to take this home with you. Maybe take out that other sheet of paper you had a couple weeks ago that had my mission field. These are specific people you already know who don't know the Lord. And think about what what do they talk about? What are they interested in? And how can I bring biblical truth into that conversation? I'll give you two examples, one of my father's and one of my own. Quite a few years ago, and I'm sure some of you will remember this, there was a scare with Tylenol. Somebody had gotten in and put cyanide in certain tablets of of Tylenol, and then they went out into the marketplace. And people from all over the country were 
mysteriously dying of cyanide poisoning, and you come to find out it was all traced back to this Tylenol. And that was really on the minds of people at the time. A lot of people were scared. You know, they had a headache or a backache. They weren't sure if they should even take anything because the next thing you know, you could be dead. And at that time, my dad had taken a little break from driving a truck. He was working in a machine shop. And he noticed that all of the fellows were talking about this Tylenol scare. And he had a chance to kind of interject, you know, it just, lets, it just reminds us how fragile life is. At any moment, we could be gone. What happens then? And it made him think. He was actually able to lead one of those co-workers to Christ, starting with something that you wouldn't think had anything to do with the gospel, but starting where they were, bringing them to Christ. Now, my example isn't quite that dramatic, but it was just as effective. A number of years ago, I'm a sports fan, I think some of you know that. A number of years ago, there was a Super Bowl game that literally came down to the last play. Some of you will remember this. The team was losing by a touchdown, but they had the ball on the other team's 10-yard line. There were no timeouts. There were just a few seconds left on the clock. Quarterback throws the ball to a receiver. He catches it at about the 5-yard line, and immediately a defender grabbed his feet, causing him to fall. As he's falling, he stretches out as far as he can with that ball, trying to get it over the goal line, and he lands a half a yard short. And his team lost. Of course, that was big news the next day at the break room. Everybody's talking about, man, what a fantastic finish. Because a lot of times Super Bowls are blowouts, you know, and the game's decided by the end of the third quarter. Here's a game that went right down to the wire, and that guy was so close. Can you imagine if he did just a little bit more? And I said, you know what? As far as the final score is concerned, he might as well have been on the other end of the field. Because it doesn't matter if you miss it by a foot and a half or 15 yards or 150 yards, they still lost the game. And I was able to introduce the concept of Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter if you're really good, if you fall a half a yard short, you're still out. And I had their attention. It might be the latest movie that's hit the box office. It might be a best-selling book people are talking about, although nobody reads anymore, so probably not. Uh, it, it can be a fashion trend. It can, whatever it is that people are interested in, there are ways of going from that point and bringing scriptural truth into the conversation. You do it subtly. You do it uh, intelligently. It can be a very effective way of watering that plant, helping to grow that seed of truth that somebody else had planted, and sharing Christ with them in a meaningful way. Be practical. Now, sometimes what people are interested in or what they're involved in is not exactly pleasing to God. It may not be pleasing to us. We need to be positive. I shared a couple weeks ago when that book and then the movie, The Da Vinci Code, came out. Oh, man, everybody was talking about it. Best-selling book, big-time box office. Turned out to be a flop, but there were big names in it anyway. And uh, people were talking about it. I thought it was garbage. When I read that book, it made me mad. But I knew that if I expressed that to the guys at my work, they'd shut me off. So we got to talking about it. And I, I, instead of telling them what I thought, I asked them questions. What do you think? What did you think about what they had to say? And we were able to talk about the truth. Even about something I didn't care for myself. Paul ran into this in the book of Acts, 17. Goes to Athens. 
And in verse 16, we read that when Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. I mean, everywhere you look, there's some idol temple here and there and there and there. And I mean, there, were, there were more idol temples than there were fast food restaurants nowadays. And, and it really bothered him. He was greatly distressed. But later on, when he had a chance to talk to the people... We see his first words in verse 22 of the same chapter. Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. He didn't come out and say, men of Athens, you ignorant, idolatrous pieces of garbage. (laughs) Now maybe he felt that way, I don't know, but he didn't say it. He didn't share it. He was positive. He understood that even though... They believed in something false, and they were practicing something sinful. They are still people. A person of worth, because they're created in the image of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross for them. That makes them worth it. And you may see people on the television, or you might see people posting on Facebook, and it just... They even have an angry emoji now that you can do. And boy, there are a lot of times I want to push that. It's like, oh, don't do it, don't do it. Breathe. Remember, they're people. Don't label them. Don't slap a label on them and say, oh, well, they're just a drug addict. They're just an alcoholic, this, that, or the other thing. Don't. They're a person. Address them as people. Be as positive as you can about them. Because they're the ones that Jesus died for. Another important principle is to be personal. Don't be afraid to share your own story. We sang earlier, I love to tell the story. And we do need to get to the point where we tell the story of Jesus and his love. But don't be afraid to tell your story. Tell how God has meant something in your life, what he has done for you. Don't be afraid to talk about times when you have failed or times when, when you were fearful. You say, well, don't, shouldn't we talk just about the successes? No, people really don't care about your successes. They, they get jealous and they turn you off. They are much more interested to find out that they're, you're just like them that you go through the same difficulties and you've been through the same failures that they have, and yet you're at another point than they are, and they want to be where you are. Be personal. Share your testimony. Share where you've been and what Christ has done for you. The Bible says in Acts 1-8, you will be my witnesses. You know what a witness is in a courtroom? Doesn't have to be an expert. They're just asked, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you experience? Jesus said, you're to be my witnesses. He doesn't say you'll be my attorneys. We are not to argue the case. We're not to press the truth or prove it. We're not to push for a verdict. That's the attorney's job. We're to be a witness. We're to share what we've experienced. We're to share what we know. And personal stories are often easier to relate than principles. You don't have to remember quite as much because it's there. (laughs) They also can't refute it. When you tell somebody what God has done in your life, they can't say, no, he didn't. (laughs) He did. (laughs) It's something that is irrefutable. And when you share... Maybe some painful experiences that God has brought you through, that's going to speak volumes to them. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Now, some of us just put a period right there. Thank you, God, you always comfort me in all my troubles. But Paul goes on. He says, so that you can comfort others with the same comfort you've received. You see, if I talk to somebody, they're going through a really stressful, challenging time. 
and I can share with them the truth of God's word and I can pray with them and that might make them feel better. But if you've been through what they're going through and you can come and say, hey, I understand how that feels. I've been there. I've experienced that. Let me share you how God brought me through. They're going to listen to you before they're going to listen to me. And you sometimes wonder why God brings you through experiences, why God brings you through tough times. It may be so that you can reach somebody that's going to go through the same thing down the road. That is a very powerful draw when you can say, I've been there. I've experienced that. It makes a world of difference. And then finally, we need to be patient. Benjamin Franklin wrote, haste makes waste. And I find that very true in the field of evangelism. Sometimes we get in such a hurry, we want to close the deal. We want to make sure they come to Christ, and we get pushy. And you know what happens when Christians get pushy in evangelism? They push people away. (laughs) They push them further away from God than they were in the first place. Don't be pushy. I know the time is of an essence. I know that they're not guaranteed tomorrow. I know that they may not be around later, and you shouldn't put things off But we should not be pushy when it comes to sharing our faith. James 5, 7 writes, Be patient then, brothers. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. Farmers know they've got to wait till just the right time to plant. If you plant too soon, you can lose your whole crop. And they have to wait for the rain, and they have to wait for the sun, and they have to wait for those plants to grow and develop and mature. And it might be tempting in the middle of July when that corn is, you know, 10 feet high and it's so nice and green, and you think, oh, this is great, let's go harvest it. That's a wrong time to harvest. You actually have to wait for it to look dead. <laughs> You wait for it to turn brown. I think of that with soybeans. Boy, soybeans look beautiful when they're all leafy and green. And boy, it just looks so nice. They look downright ugly when they're ready to harvest. But you'd better wait until they're ready to harvest. We need to be patient. Don't be pushy. You may not be the one to lead them to Christ. That's okay. Maybe you're planting the seed. Maybe you're watering it. Let God... Take care of the growth. Maybe the most tangible way to do it, we see also in the book of James. 119 says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Those are good steps to take when we're sharing our faith. Be quick to listen. Sometimes we're so quick to speak. We give them the answer before they've given us the question. Now, we know the answer is Jesus, but they want to be able to state the question. (laughs) They want to be heard. They want to know that we care about them. They're not just a notch in our belt. They're not just a prize to be won. They matter to us. Listen. Listen. Be slow to react. Listen for the topic. Let them set the agenda. Find out what's important to them and then take that route to Jesus. Listen for the tone. Are they angry? Are they sad? Are they scared? Where are they coming from? And then look for traps. They may be trying to set you up. Next week, we're going to look at specific questions that people give to try to throw us off. They're probably looking for an excuse not to believe. I'm going to give you some answers that you can give. But listen. And by being prepared, by being practical, being positive, being personal, and being patient, we can water those plants that have been seeded into their hearts. We can help it to grow. And maybe we'll be the ones to lead them to Christ. Maybe somebody else will be down the road. But it's ultimately God that makes things grow. We don't save anybody. Only God saves And he uses us at various points in the process with different people. 
then you sit back and you watch God work, and it is truly amazing.